Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Web Delix Podcast, where we're on a journey to find the truth about plant medicines, get rid of the myths, and change the narrative. I'm your host, Scott Mason, and with us today are two true superstars, Zappy Zappelin and Jonathan Lubecki. I'll start with Zappy, and I'll keep it real. Both of these gentlemen have bios that are so accomplished, so overwhelming, that it was a bit hard to even begin to do them justice in the few minutes that we have. So I'm going to give it a try, uh, but I urge that you learn more about both of them and their organizations after you listen to or watch the entire episode. You will be very impressed, as I was. Zappi is a futurist, award-winning filmmaker, and psychedelic concierge to the stars. With an MBA from Harvard, Zappi founded the Mind Army, a social movement dedicated to legalizing psychedelics via presidential executive order. He's also founded the Ketamine Fund, which provides free ketamine treatments to veterans suffering from PTSD. Zappi additionally co-founded KetaMD, a telemedicine platform that provides affordable and life-changing at-home medical ketamine treatment. He's also the chief visionary officer at Psycheceutical, a bioscience company in the psychedelic industry. Whew, that was, that was amazing. Now let's get to Jonathan and be prepared to be amazed again. Jonathan's educational background includes a degree from the Citadel. After time as a sergeant in the U.S. Army and Marines, he's performed veterans' advocacy work at the state and federal level, worked on congressional and presidential campaigns, and done legislative, policy, and grassroots organizing consulting on the behalf of veteran groups for years. He's currently the president of Lubecki Strategic Direction, a boutique strategic communication firm focusing on psychedelic research. Jonathan and Zappi, welcome to the show. Thank hey, great to be here. Thanks for having us. It is, no, thank you. It is a privilege to have you here. Now, let's just lay the groundwork for a minute. In the episodes that the Web Delix podcast has record, recorded so far, we have really taken a object lesson in psychedelics from the ground up. We've talked to scientists about what exactly psychedelics and plant medicines are. We have heard from those scientists about what they uh, can do to the brain to help people that are really suffering from a whole host of problems, not to mention boosting their creativity and helping their performance and having amazing spiritual experiences. Uh, we have really heard um, and been moved by profound stories about how these medicines have changed people's lives. And for anyone listening right now, I want to in particular reference two recent episodes. One was the episode uh, that was featuring a guest by the name of Molly Maloof, a doctor who has significant experience in this space, who shared a lot of stories in her personal world about people who truly had brain transformations or both physical and emotional transformations that were beyond profound. She also had some thoughts about some of the risks associated with these medicines. There was also an episode that we did featuring a woman named Lois Kofi. Now, I have hosted hundreds of podcast episodes across a number of different topics. And her story about how psychedelics took her from the brink of the most profound despair into a place of complete transformation and healing was without question one of the most powerful stories I have heard in my life anywhere. And I mention Lois Kofi in particular because I started out, as I'm sure a lot of folks did, and maybe you two did too, coming from a place of curiosity, but ultimately ignorance. And yes, the science is interesting. Yes, understanding what it can do provides me with the intellectual comfort. But after hearing stories like those that Molly and Lois provided, my heart has opened. I'm thinking about things differently. And that's why I felt it was so important to have you here today to talk about the implications of that. 
like I said, I assume at one point or another, both of you were in places where psychedelics weren't at the center of your work or, or personal lives. And Jonathan, I'm going to turn the stage over to you to start off with the answer to this first question, and we can begin the discussion from here. You are a former military guy. You've worked for Republican presidential candidates. You are not the sort of person that I would have imagined would be here on a podcast with me one day talking about, look, I can't even imagine myself having been the person who'd be talking to you about psychedelics, but I can't even imagine you even less being the guy talking about psychedelics today. Talk to us a little bit about your journey from here, from there to here. Well, one, uh, well, yes, I have worked on Repo Republican presidential campaigns. I've also worked on Republican and Democrat congressional campaigns, Senate campaigns, mm -hmm. and all sorts of different campaigns. I, I, I frequently say I work for people, not parties. Um, mm, and, and, and I talk to candidates. Before, and, and I'm in a fortunate position where I can be selective. If I don't want to work for a candidate, I don't have to. Um, but, I, but I do talk with them. And I didn't come into psychedelics out of curiosity or ignorance or any of that, I discovered psychedelics entirely by accident um, because I was a veteran suffering from severe PTSD. I had already had five suicide attempts, been hospitalized, etc. And so a intern who was working at the VA in Charleston slid a piece of paper across the desk in, in, a, in a therapy session, said, I'm not supposed to tell you about this, so open it up when you, when you get home. And I open it up and it says Google MDMA PTSD. Unfortunately, uh, MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, was conducting a clinical research trial in Charleston, South Carolina. I was the 26th person in a 25 person wow. sub study uh, focusing on veterans and first responders. Although I will say the majority of the people who've gone through the MAPS trial uh, have actually been sexual assault victims and not veterans. Although we're typically the ones who talk about it. In, in part because as veterans, our, our trauma is socially acceptable. I, I can be on this yeah. podcast and say, I deployed to Iraq 0506. I came back and I had PTSD. And there's no questions yeah. about that. Yeah. If, there's, if you are a rape victim or you were a victim of childhood sexual or physical abuse, you may not want to go on a webcast. You may not want to go on Netflix. You may not, yeah. you know, you want to heal as we all do, but you also may not want to yeah. have that trauma out in the world because there's very little stigma and shame. And sadly, the stigma and shame associated with being a veteran actually comes from the left, not the right. But, um, you know, it, it's a lot easier for me to come talk about these things. I also happen to be a person who doesn't shut up about it. Um, I, it, it would drive, drive everyone in my life nuts because I would talk to, like, I'll talk to people in the grocery store line about it. Um, wow. Because it's been so transformative in my life, mm. and my motivation to to continue to stay in this field is entirely based on the fact that you know this past Saturday I went down to uh, change the command ceremony for a guy I served with in Iraq, Captain Taylor Essex, and, and was able to hang out with some some guys I served with overseas, and mm -hmm. you know I see people around me with PTSD. You know I, I you know talked with with Captain Essex about. You know, he has guys who, who have issues and, and we discussed it. Uh, that's the reason I fight is because I'm very cognizant of the fact that I was I was blessed to be able to be healed. There's a lot of people who don't have that same ability. So I fight every single day to ensure that everyone has access to it. And that gets a little interesting. And there, there's a bunch of stuff I think me and, me and Zappy um, – will agree on. I, I think one of the, the fundamental ones is the fact that psychedelics are extremely beneficial for mental health, spirituality, and, and uh, you know, uh, recreational use. I mean, they're, they're, some of them are, are quite fun. But I also think that medical use, religious use, and, and then adult use are three very different things. Mm. And those three different things come with their own set of complications and discussion points. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things, that I, to be honest, I'm very fearful of is I see how medical cannabis and cannabis legalization has gone since 
1992, veterans were very much a face of medical cannabis and they still can't access it through the VA. And, and what ended up happening is because we went through decriminalization rather than a top-down legalization and FDA approved cannabis, et cetera, the people who most need it can't get it. And the people who want it, who were getting it anyway, now are, are, are safer to do so. And I, I have a big fear of that occurring within the psychedelics community that the people who are leading the charge are the ones who are being left behind. I want to thank you so much for sharing that. And I want to hold on to that last portion for a minute because we're going to talk about that after we get to Zappi's story. But I wanted to go back to one element of your story. As a learning person, you, I hear this all the time. The psychedelic experiences that I've had have been transformative. And I, I, I sometimes have a hard time grasping and understanding in concrete terms what that means. Jonathan, what did, a, what, how, what, how did transformative manifest itself in your life? What does that mean to you? Well, one, I, I'll, I'll freely admit, I don't use a lot of psychedelics. And this is something that surprises so many people, mm. you know, I've never done LSD and it's funny. People will come up to me and start talking. It, it, it's rather interesting when I talk to people left, right, conservative, progressive, doesn't really matter. They typically within about five or 10 minutes will tell me about their first psychedelic experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've only done MDMA three times as part of the clinical trial. Mm -hmm. I've done ayahuasca twice as part of a religious ceremony and it actually had no effect on me. Um, mm. and I'm fairly certain I know why. Um, and I, I live in Washington, DC where, mm -hmm. um, plant-based psychedelics are decriminalized. So I have used mushrooms a, a couple of times, but this is not a daily thing for me. This isn't a frequent thing for me, but, it, but back to your question on, on transformation, going through MDMA therapy fundamentally changed my life to the point where it is the reason that my son has a father instead of a folded flag. And, you know, it made the suicidal ideation that I had day in and day out go away. It made flashbacks go away. It did things as simple as allowed me to sleep through the night, which is transformative. You know, one of the things we don't talk about when we talk about mental injuries like PTSD, depression, and others is how much lack of sleep actually affects and makes everything worse. And with PTSD, as well as others, the symptoms kind of cause this super downward spiral mm -hmm. um, where they all, all the symptoms make the other symptoms worse. Um, and, and this is where psychedelics, you know, I view them as a tool. I view them as, as, as a medicine and, and tools need to be used properly under proper conditions. But it's a tool to put the mind, body, and spirit in the place it needs to be for the therapy to work. And, and this is the fundamental thing is the therapeutic. If we're talking about medical, if we're talking about, you know, adult use at, at, at a festival or something, that's a different conversation. We, we can talk harm reduction, and, et cetera. But if we're talking in a medical context, that is something different. And this is where the, it's a tool to put the mind, body, and spirit in the place it can be. Or, or needs to be. And one of my fears is that so many people are with mental health conditions are so used to, I take this pill, I take mm -hmm. this thing, mm -hmm. and it just makes everything go away. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about mental health and psychedelics, that isn't ex how, how this works. And my fear is negative outcomes with people who are doing this in unsupervised areas with untested and black market substances thinking, hey, I saw this guy on Webadelix, MDMA changed his life, I'm just gonna go take some MDMA and I'll, and I'll be like him. And that isn't what this is. And I think blurring the lines between medicinal, spiritual and adult use is a disservice to the people who truly need it. There's a lot in what you said that we're gonna pick up on, but I do have to say two things. Number one, I 
have dealt with PTSD myself of a different nature and origin, but in terms of your description of it creating this cycle where the symptoms end up building on each other and escalating the whole thing, I honestly never heard it framed that way or thought about that, but that is it's very true. Number one. And then number two, it's funny that you mentioned this whole idea of hearing about something and then uh, pursuing it anywhere. I, you know, my, I knew about magic mushrooms kind of a little bit because I read about it somewhere. I knew someone who had a homie, two apartments down in Brooklyn, who had could get some for me. And that was one of the fears I have why I didn't pursue that because, yo, the homie down in Brooklyn, right? Like, whatever. But that being said, I learned to be a little bit more open about that. Now, speaking of openness, Zappy, as I mentioned during the introduction, you are a Harvard MBA. And what I didn't mention, because there were so many other amazing things there, was that you were the youngest vice president in the history of one of Wall Street's most prestigious investment banks. Not someone that I would imagine one day would be talking to me with the coolest sunglasses in the world about psychedelics. Yo, yo there has to be a story there. Sure, of course. Um, so my story is basically that I, when I grew up and I was younger, I had some very positive psychedelic experiences. Uh, one in particular where I saw all of the trillions of atoms in my hand and they were just vibrating at this certain frequency. And then I looked over at my friend and he was the same atoms, just a slightly different frequency. And I looked at the table, same atoms, different frequency. I was like, oh my God, like I just realized there's a lot more going on here than just like what I'm seeing with my five senses. And so years and years later, as you described, I did everything society told me to do, you know, go to school, get a job, make money, have a family. You'll be totally fulfilled. The American dream, just do that and everything's going to be great. And I did it and I was sitting there and I was like, wow, like I, I'm not fulfilled. I don't even know what I'm doing here. And so this is uh, 2000, around 2010, I was having like a spiritual midlife crisis where I didn't know what I was doing. So I had thought back to my psychedelic experience. I thought about the shamans that were in Peru in the jungle that were using things like ayahuasca. And I thought, I have to do this because if I don't go inside myself for some answers and some healing, I might never find anything. I already tried to find it outside of myself and it's not there. So in 2011, I went down to Peru and brought a film crew. I brought Michelle Rodriguez, the actress from mm -hmm. Fast and Furious, uh, to come with me. And we had this incredible experience with Ayahuasca and San Pedro. I came back for, uh, and for a couple of years, I just followed our lives and things that happened to us. And eventually, as you would see in the reality of truth movie, something very miraculous happened from that experience where a plant medicine, legal plant medicine center called Vivmia was open in Costa Rica. Now, you know, thousands of people have gone through there as a result of the movie. And, and you know, we've, it's been watched over 15 million times. They say that over a million people have done plant medicine or psychedelics because of that movie. And so as amazing as that is, when I came back from the jungle and I started to tell everybody, oh my God, you got to go do ayahuasca. And I noticed that all my friends who really needed it, they couldn't do it their families would like put them in a mental institution if they said they were going to go down to the jungle to work yeah. this thing out. Yeah. So I started looking for that Western medicine approach. And in 2015, I found ketamine. And I was like, wow, this is potentially the gateway, an FDA approved medication that can put a consciousness state totally safe and people can go to the doctor's office. They don't have to get on a plane and go to Peru. This could be really the Western gateway. And I tried the ketamine treatments. It blew my mind, you know, to that point of when you say, why was it transformational? Yeah. Well, you know, like every time I have one of these ketamine experiences, which, you know, has been proven by Yale university to be 70% effective against even treatment resistant depression. What happens in the ketamine is you go into this present moment awareness state. There's no past. There's no future. You're just in the present moment. And you can look at things in your life from kind of like a third party perspective. Mm. And that can be a lifetime of healing mm. in 45 minutes. Wow. And so, 
yeah, when I realized that, I was like, wow, I have to like really dive in here because I was having the realization and I'm sitting here in the Mind Army headquarters. Our slogan is fighting for the right to pursue happiness. Yes. And I realized that we're in a crisis situation and I'm not going to sit here in 2022 and have people tell me that alcohol is good, tobacco is good, but somehow psilocybin mushrooms are bad. And even if you're in a crisis or your family member is going to kill themselves, you can't use it because 55 years ago, we said that we needed to study it for safety. And now all that time's gone by. Millions of people have done it, many with great benefit. So I'm not going to sit here in a mental health crisis coming out of this pandemic with everybody having some level of PTSD. Yeah. And I'm not going to watch, you know, 50,000 people, 100,000 people a year die of suicide and another 100,000 die of an overdose and sit here and go, well, let's keep studying it. Because like, you know, people always, the one point I want to make is people always say, well, I, obviously there must be some reason the FDA isn't making this legal. Like, what is it? And is it not safe or what? And I say, no, it's a political situation. It's a financial situation because if the definition of a schedule one drug is that it has no medical benefit and it's highly addictive. The fact that psychedelics are number one, not ha do have medical benefit and are non-addictive number is number one. But if that were the case and the, the FDA was playing by the rules, no medical benefit, highly addictive, then cigarettes would be on schedule one and they're not. What do you know? You got thousands and hundreds of thousands of people dying a year of cigarettes and they're not on the list. So obviously something's going on. And I actually want to make the point. I don't think it's a big conspiracy. I actually think it's a lack of education. Like you said at the beginning, doctors don't know about this stuff. Most doctors I know, they don't even know about nutrition, you know, and that could fix most of what they're dealing with. So if they don't know about nutrition, why would I think they know about psychedelic medicine? They don't. We have to, the psychonauts, the people right here that have the but experience. We, but we, we also have to, have to be honest. To them. And, and, and I'll be honest, you, you just said that, that you, you, you cannot uh, overdose on psychedelics. Do you want to tell me that you cannot overdose on ketamine or that you cannot overdose on MDMA? Well, you, you could die of drinking water. So, of course, anything can okay, kill you but the, you but, but do let's, too much but, of it to disrupt your body. But, but it, you, could eat your, you could eat your entire weight in psilocybin mushrooms and not well, die. So we have to not pretend that all these things are dangerous and we have to wait a longer time. No, and I, and, to and, and that's out where I agree with you. With but things. I think if we're going to make claims like you cannot overdose, then you need to specify, hey, psilocybin mushrooms specifically, because there are compounds that are listed as psychedelics where you can overdose. And, you know, it, it, and this is where we, we have to be honest about harms and risks and other things and not say this is the end all be all cure for everything. And, and this is and when it's us, the psychonauts, going and talking to doctors and saying, go do whatever you want. Hey, that depression patient who's coming in and paying $400 every three days to do ketamine for the past two years, maybe that's not working for them and maybe that's something else. And, you know, I've personally seen people trade one addiction for another. The other thing I want to push back on is PTSD is in the DSM-5. It's an actual mental health condition saying everyone who has trauma has PTSD is a disservice and an insult to people who have PTSD, especially severe PTSD. You know, there, there's qualifications. There are, yeah, like, I, no, like, I, I'm not I, saying trauma yeah, doesn't affect for sure. people's lives, but there's a level where it becomes a disorder and people who have it below that, dis that level, I have no problem saying everyone who came out of the pandemic is suffering from different types of trauma for different things. Absolutely. That doesn't mean everyone has PTSD. That's like saying, hey, everyone who, 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 who uses psychedelics may hallucinate. Therefore, they all have schizophrenia. So, no, because it doesn't meet the definition. That's different than saying all people have trauma. Yeah. I w let me, yeah, let me, let me make one medical point, and this comes from Nature Magazine. I just want to point out just how powerful the science is right here. Uh, they did a study on ketamine in low doses, and – what came out of that was that they, it turns out you have this area of your brain called the default mode network. 
And in there, there's this mechanism called your lateral habenula. And your lateral habenula is recording all the stress you've ever had in your whole life. And when it becomes too much for you, it puts your brain into burst mode. And when your brain's in burst mode, it shuts off your dopamine production. That's your happiness, your motivation, mm. getting none of it. The first time you do medical ketamine, it takes the brain out of burst mode and you immediately start getting your dopamine back. So we get these calls the next day from people that like the ketamine fund where you've given out 500 treatments to veterans and they go home. The next day we get the call from the husband or the wife and they go, like, oh my God, he just cleaned the garage. He was claiming he's going to do that for five years. Like whatever you're doing, keep doing it. But the reality is his brain was in burst mode and it's subjective. Everybody's burst mode is different. Some people, it might take a real war. Somebody else, it might just be something that happened oh, in their no, childhood no. And, or, the, and PT, or the trauma no, that and, they and, and, and experienced. And don't misunderstand me. People can very much have PTSD from multiple sources of trauma. And it could be something as simple as a car accident. I, I've talked to people who have who have PTSD because they blew out their knee in the big game and they were supposed to go to the NFL. There's all sorts of different reasons. And the, the level of trauma that causes your PTSD is is different for everyone but that doesn't mean everyone has ptsd um and and, and this is where part of the yeah. problem i see is th this this move to say everyone has ptsd these drugs are now prescribed for ptsd therefore we can prescribe these to everyone and and like and all that is is th that's not medicine and you know when 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 I mean, when you when you have yeah. psychi you know, well, I, at home I think... psychiatric care sending out and we're just talking schedule two right now, like like benzos, uh, you know, to 95 percent of their patients. And the reason it's not 100 percent, according to documents from those companies that are currently under DOJ investigation, is if we did 100 percent, then we'd be a pill mill. And this is part of my concern is, you know, everybody wants to rush to this. It's interesting how many ketamine clinics, and I'm not saying, you know, Zappy, you're, how you do this is bad. I, you know, I have every faith and confidence that you do this in an ethical, responsible way to to mitigate and, and, and diminish the, the, the harms that do exist to the best of your ability. That doesn't mean everyone's Zappy. There are ketamine clinics that are, are pumping patients through, not providing support, not providing, you know, you know, therapy, no integration, none of this, because it's all about making money. And this is where, you know, when you're talking, say, decriminalization, cool, then everybody becomes a shaman. And, and you know, there's negative outcomes. Aaron Rodgers did ayahuasca. We saw what that did. The, uh, the guy who wore horns and furs and painted his face uh, is known as the insurrection shaman for a reason. So this idea that just do mushrooms in the world will be great. There's multiple situations where that has proven not to be true. And that's part of my concern. And it's this widening of the envelope of what is medicine yeah. to give it to the people who just want to go have fun on a Friday night. Well, let me get some clarity about this, though. Zappi, particularly because you're advocating for legalization generally of psychedelics via executive order. That could happen, like, you know, just with a signature and a document being written. What would that look like if the um, – what would the executive order say, and how would that play out in the world under your vision? Yeah, thank you. You know, so the Mind Army is um, is fighting for legalization. We do believe that we're in a crisis. We do believe that these are, in general, very safe. And we just have to do the type of investigation as to who's allergic, who shouldn't have it, all these things that should have happened over the last five decades that couldn't happen because of this taboo nature and, and, and being put in this box. So for me, you know, I look at this uh, as a situation whereby you know, psychedelics to me are a reconnection to the miracle that we're living in every moment mm -hmm. of life. You know, we got the sun's 93 million miles away, mm -hmm. perfect for an atmosphere. You're talking on chi to China on video in real time. And people are like, oh, there's no miracles. Yeah, is that, everything's boring. Yeah, nothing happened. And I'm like, wow, you know, when you have a psychedelic experience, you're able to tap back into how miraculous life is. And I remember giving one of the veterans, the ketamine fund gave a veteran in Utah, 
Uh, he was on 22 medications from the VA. We gave him ketamine treatment for free. Uh, he had been homicidal and suicidal, almost gotten a shootout with the cops and had to be checked in. He's on 22 medications. He said after his first 45 minute ketamine treatment in the right set and setting, he said he came out of it and he said, I felt hope for the first time. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I went home and I hugged my kids and I mm -hmm. felt love for the first time in 10 years. So I'm saying, how, you know, can that be kept from these veterans? This is like $2 worth of ketamine to the Veterans Administration. And this guy's on 22 psychotic medications with all kinds of, you know, hey, talk therapy. Uh, hey, I, 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 we are out of control right now. What would it look like? I was on 42 pills a day from the VA, and I, I, I'm completely off them. I do use cannabis for pain control. Um, but, but here's the thing. You're not wrong. The problem is, let's talk about the rest of the story. So let's take Initiative 81 in D.C. Used veterans and people suffering from depression and all of this to decriminalize all plant-based psychedelics in D.C. All sorts of promises were made on harm reduction. All sorts of promises were made about these clinics that are going to open up and provide free treatment and therapies to, to people and all these things, which is all fantastic. The second it passed, the weed delivery services were uh, delivering mushrooms throughout the, the District of Columbia. And none of the things that they promised ever showed up. And this is this is the thing. I, I actually agree more with legalization over decriminalization, in part because I think one of the biggest problems that we have in this country when it comes to drugs is pollution of the drug supply by outside actors. <clears throat> and, you know, when we're talking about things like ketamine or MDMA, when you buy it on the street, it very much can, can be laced with fentanyl. Um, and these are issues that decriminalization doesn't address. I, I have no issues personally if somebody can go buy a bag of 100% of, of pharmaceutical grade, like manufactured at GMP standards, heroin at CVS by showing an ID. But, you know, there needs to be some protections, one for the people who are going to get therapy so they're not abused. And this is where people saying, I'm going to heal you by giving you these substances that, that are mind altering substances with no protections. Like we, when we allow people to give anesthesia, which is obviously a very powerful medication that, that has risk, we have an anesthesiologist. They're specially certified. And you know what? If they diddle their patients, there's a method for that patient to come forward and report them to the state health agency, et cetera, et cetera. Doing these things through decrim and allowing anybody to say, I'm a psychedelic shaman, come follow me, puts a lot of people at, at risk, puts a lot of people in danger. All I'm saying is, if, if we do, through, say, an executive order, for example, legalize these things, there are a lot of things that need to be put into place that just saying anybody can do whatever they want, do not do. And I think that, you know, this idea that somebody isn't going to say, hey, I'm going to heal you. Why don't you come sit in my basement? I'm going to give you LSD or I'm going to give you ketamine to the point where you're unconscious and then they wake up with their clothes off. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to mention names or cities, but I, I will be completely honest. I know a ketamine therapist yeah. who has been credibly accused multiple times of inviting coworkers and patients back to his house, giving them something that isn't ketamine and saying it's Oof. ketamine, and then sexually assaulting them. Now, the sad, the saddest. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I do have to ask me, the yeah, one yeah, thing before yeah. we move on, and that is I just want to make sure. sure for the audience's sake that they understand the difference between legalization and decriminalization. Because um, we're all sort of experts in the legalese of this stuff. I don't know that the audience necessarily is. So if one or both of you, maybe Zappy, if you could explain what that is, and then we'll move into your response to this. But I, I do want to make sure there's clarity here for anyone sure. watching. Sure. So, so far, some of the states have decriminalized, meaning if you're found having psychedelic compounds on you, it's not a crime. They're not going to charge you with a crime. They're not going to spend police monies on that. However, it's not legal. Doctors can't use it. It can't be researched. It's not available to you to consume for mental health or addiction reasons. So what I say is, you know, there's always going to be abuses. You know, you have 
priests and rabbis and people who are, you know, abusing people. So in anything we do, there's going to be some abuse. But when you have 100,000 people a year dying in this country of a drug overdose and you have 100,000 committing suicide, that's not the moment to say this needs to be more regulated than anything else. This is the moment where we have to accept that if enough people have a proper psychedelic experience in the right set and setting and they expand their consciousness and they come out with more empathy that if we have a mass group like that we can solve any problem we have including the ones that we're talking about right here and the reason i just want to tell you why i'm moving so fast is that ray kurzweil the futurist he's the was chief science officer at google google he says that in the year 2045 when humans ha are reach singularity where their brain is directly connected to the internet with the whole cloud with ai running calculations in the year 2045 that human being will be one billion times more intelligent than we are today and you think about that you go oh that's really cool but it's also very scary yeah. because that means <laughs> anybody can it. create yeah <laughs> Anybody could create a nuclear weapon. Yeah. Anybody could break up with their girlfriend. So do you believe we should dose the, the water city. supply? We like, have to raise consciousness good? now, get that critical mass going. Um, I don't think we should necessarily do that, but I think that the government in the position that they're in with the science they're in, they should probably consider whether something other than fluoride in the water would make more sense for its citizens. And then I think, you know, the scary part is I've heard about something coming out called ISO. And this ISO, whatever you add it to, makes it 25 times more powerful. They're starting to add it to the fentanyl. So we're about to see fentanyl deaths go up by 25 times coming up soon with the ISOs. And there's nothing to break that addiction except yep. ibogaine, which is an African psychedelic root. And so the first thing that the Mind Army is doing is we are asking for the descheduling of ibogaine because it never should have been on the schedule in the first place. And this comes from Rick Doblin, a conversation I had with Rick at MAPS. And Rick said that the what happened was there were some drug dealers in the early 70s and they were dealing drugs. They got addicted to their own heroin and then they wound up finding ibogaine. They took it and it broke their heroin addiction. But the cops raided their place. They came in and said, oh, they got LSD, they got heroin, they got the ibogaine, put it all on the schedule. And ibogaine's already been proven to be non-addictive, so it shouldn't be on the schedule. And Rick Doblin asked us as the Mind Army to focus our first effort in getting ibogaine descheduled so that we can actually have something that, because you can't stop from somebody from getting addicted. Why not, make it, get schedule, why not make it schedule four? You know, the, part, part of this is, this, this, this idea, and, I, and again, we all agree that this helps. I'm saying it can be done, you know, you're saying if it's all done in a proper set setting, et cetera, et cetera. I agree with you completely. I'm saying, let's ensure that happens instead of it being a free-for-all. Because you mentioned, yes, last year, 120,000 people died of drug overdoses. That was mostly, it had to do with fentanyl. There, there was roughly a 15% increase nationwide. Oregon, which, which uh, fully decriminalized all drugs on the promise that this would solve that problem had a 40 percent increase because you know why because once they legalized it none of the harm reduction that was promised none of the things that they said they would do trust us ever happened and this is where it, like the discussion isn't whether these work the discussion should be how can we effectively get these treatments to the people who need them in the safest way possible and I think there's a solution beyond saying, hey, let's let anybody and everybody sell anything and everything they want out of the back of a truck like a rutabaga. But, you know, I believe that, that if you're going to give somebody something, that it, that it should be pure. When it comes to psilocybin, one of, the problem, one of the concerns I have is people going and foraging who don't know what the hell they're doing. And somebody, you know, and, and that's, hey, do, do I trip? Do I get no effect? Or do I die? And I think calling... I, I, it, it, I find it very disturbing within the psychedelic movement that anytime people says, hey, what about safety? What about the people that you're talking about healing and their safety? That gets thrown out the window. Uh, yeah, I, I'm gonna, just going to say this lastly on this. I think the proportion is what's not being taken into consideration, because as Rick said, you know, 39 people have died in the last 55 years because of ibogaine. They say it's cardiotoxic. 39 people. 
You're talking about millions that have died from drug overdoses that could have disrupted that with ibogaine. So the scale's not the same. If we had had the and how many, psilocybin- Hold on, hold on. How many women in, or in men in this country have been sexually assaulted because someone gave them drugs? Uh, probably the same amount that were sexually assaulted by people who do sexual assaults, whether you're a plumber or a priest or, a, you know, and anything, there are people here that have problems. And these people, if they had been given these sexual uh, uh, assaulters, if they'd properly been given in a medical setting, proper psychedelics, they never would That's have all done I'm that asking first for place. is for that. And, it, 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 literally, it's that. Uh, what, what I, the problem I have is when people say everyone's a therapist. I think that if you are going to do therapy for people with mental illness using psychedelics, you should have some specialized training. I think that, that you should be a, a, a therapist in some way. Now, we could talk about like they don't need to be a PhD uh, uh, psychologist or an MD psychiatrist. You know, I'll, I'll be honest, 68 x-rays, which are behavioral health special enlisted behavioral health specialists in the U.S. Army who have specialized training in addition to a high school diploma could very easily do this. Like I I'm saying I would, I will tell you, I would love to see the native Americans and first nations to be the people who guide and hold space for people trying to break addiction or depression absolutely. to have the protocol from some people who could hold space. And I think like the reality of it is that, you know, a lot of these therapists, a lot of these doctors, even these anesthesiologists who are maybe have a ketamine clinic, they've never even tried ketamine. And I can tell you, if you haven't tried it, you can't well, that, really that's help why someone. part of the protocol, you could have taken all the other psychedelics and not well, that one. Pro- and, and you're not this really is that why helpful. part of the, the, the maps training protocol, Rick Doblin's training protocol. He felt that it was critical that to, in order to graduate that you, you, use MDMA and there's a few others for people who don't want to like holotropic breath work and a few other things that also qualify to graduate. But I agree with you. You should, you should, because you can't fundamentally understand it unless you have, but I'm saying that training needs, needs to be done. And and I do understand what you're talking about. Yes. There's lots of people suffering saying, Hey, let's protect those people as well. And and discounting that, that, that people will, will, will uh, use these things to sexually assault people, I think it is, 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 is shameful, to be honest. Like, seriously, I, I, I get this, but saying everybody should. I think people, you, I think people use alcohol more to sexually abuse people than all the psychedelic abuses that have ever happened. Probably and guess what? I find that to weekend, be wrong so. too. And guess what? If I go to a, it, it, you know, but how, how many therapists, how many people have said, I'm here to heal you and then sexually assault people? And, and, and here's the other thing. But, but Zabby, not, not that, not that on, many. On. I'm going to make here's the point. The other, uh, here's, we're actually. We're here's, act- here's the other yeah. point I want to make. I, I just want to. Like, go ahead. Go we ahead. had these same, this same knowledge. We had all of this in the 60s and early 70s. And it all got made illegal. And part of that was because. There were they could point to a lot of bad outcomes. I'll tell you, I am very concerned about bad outcomes derailing all of this, and and the idea that that there won't ever be bad I'm, outcomes. I'm more concerned. That psychedelics I'm, are perfect. There can never be bad outcomes. I think is a fallacy, and it may be that way in the future, but it's not that way here there, today. There, yeah, Zappy, I want to give will you be, a, a chance yeah. to respond, and then sure. we're going to move sure. to a close here. This has been okay. amazing, all Zappy. Right. Amazing. Yeah, I was going to say, I, there's always going to be abuses of all things, you know, and finance, there's going to be people that do Ponzi schemes and rip people off and scam. Like, we have to accept that. But what we have to say is that we're in a mental health crisis. We've got an addiction emergency. We've got millions of people in trouble. And we have a solution. So if we are, if these things had been properly brought out, and I'm going to point the finger right now at the alcohol industry is the reason that these things have been kept down. It's not the pharmaceutical companies. They're going to come along. They're already getting involved in the psychedelic space. But the alcohol companies in the 1960s, they knew that this was going to replace alcohol, number one. And number two, it could break the addiction of the alcoholic, which is a huge piece of their business. So we got this situation where, you know, these things have been put underground for the wrong reasons. It's our job now to educate people and also I'm involved with a company called Psychoceutical that you mentioned, 
we're using science and patents that work in the pharma space that we're bringing over to psychedelics because we think these things need to look and resemble a pharmaceutical and a doctor has to understand the half-life, the metabolite, metabolism. We can't, no matter how much a doctor thinks that mushrooms are going to help you, psilocybin, they're not going to hand you a bag of mushrooms and go, I don't know, take two caps and a stem and let me know how it goes. This has to be made medical. And to do that, we have to no, change you don't. the law around this these is things the thing. so they can be there, studied there, and, I, and no, researched. No, no, no. But, but I just, again, I, I'm sorry. Like, I just want to. You can't. Like, like, let's be honest. The NIH is currently funding psilocybin studies. There's a lot of psilocybin research going on with both USONA and Compass. So to say we can't research it unless you completely deschedule it is not true. They said the same thing about cannabis. They said the same thing about MDMA, and MDMA is about to be FDA approved. Hopefully, if phase three goes right. And so, like, this is my thing. Well, we have to be honest. Yeah. We have to say, hey, there's harms. We should look at that. We should have ethical models to prevent these things. We should have reporting models, et cetera, et cetera, to protect these patients. And you just keep blowing that off. And this is where. No, no, I, I just lastly, I, I'll say this just to respond. I'm not blowing it off. I'm just saying the upside potential is enormous. The downside potential can be managed. It's now time for us to admit that alcohol is not good. Tobacco is not good. And psilocybin mushrooms aren't terrible for you. They might even save your life. So we just have to go into this in a way, and this is where the Mind Army is saying, we want these things studied, researched. We want, because there's plenty of harm reduction people out there. I used to go to Grateful Dead concerts, and there was always, you know, 10 people who would not go to the concert. They'd stay in the tent and help people that are having a bad trip. There's a, a service right now where you can call somebody up and have it. These people exist in every city. If we didn't make it taboo, they could all come to the surface and help and according to Dr. McIntyre, Roger McIntyre from Braxia, CAT-MD, who's the number one mood disorder person in the world, he says that we're short 4 million therapists in the United States, not psychedelic therapists, 4 million therapists. And so we have to get busy and not pretend that, you know, it's five years ago and there wasn't a pandemic and there's no fentanyl and there's no, you know, we have to admit that we have a medical opportunity and as big a change as this is going to be, this is the one that can actually save society. There's nothing else. Cannabis is, I love it. I've used it for 35 years. It's not going to break a heroin addiction. We have to have access to these powerful tools. And like an automobile, you don't just give the kid the keys when they're 16. You've got to train them and it's a powerful tool. But let's not pretend that cars are so dangerous that people die. We're not going to do it. That's no, but you need to have a li but you, no, but you need and to have a license. What we've and, learned and, and from there's, cannabis there's, is, you know, cars are highly regulated, and, and this is the thing: you you can't use cars as an example, which is a highly regulated field that has all sorts of safety devices and and everything else required by the government, and then say, but we don't need any safeguards on this because this is different. And part of the issue I have is, I think these should be treated exactly like medicine. The more you make them different than everything else, the the le the, the the more you 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 invite scrutiny. You know, MDMA assisted therapy. I view it very similar to a colonoscopy, and nobody bats an eye at that. And I agree with you. But when you have, with the increase in the use of, of these substances over the past five years, you've seen an increase in reporting on negative outcomes. And this is why we have to mitigate those. If somebody goes and does an ayahuasca ceremony, which I, I have no issues with whatsoever, but there's no, say, sober safety there and everyone is on it and somebody's unsteady on their feet, falls and cracks their head open, the headline's going to be woman dies at ayahuasca retreat, not woman trips and falls. And, and, and this is the thing. We're repeating history but by 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 ignoring things and going at light speed because the end goal is is what we want and the problem is like i'm not one of those people that thinks every single person should use drugs i think alcohol is bad i think tobacco is bad i think some i think some drugs like it's okay to say they cause great harm fentanyl causes an ungodly amount of harm so cool that's awesome let's talk about that let's talk about getting
you know, uh, more therapists. Let's talk about stopping China from from using narco warfare and fighting the opium wars in reverse. Let's yeah. not, for political purposes, go ensure that that China cuts off all communication on fentanyl and transnational criminal networks because they're about to flood this country with fentanyl for political reasons. And and, and a regulate a, a legal mm. regulated market yep. is the is the safest way to do that. I fully support that. That can also be done with an executive order. The free for all, because this is no dangerous than lettuce, is what led us in the 60s to getting everything banned. And I don't want to see this get banned because that's going to mean more people die. So yeah. I'm going to I think, I, think just, yeah, I do have to interject myself sure. here. So yeah. Jonathan, we started this yes. incredible debate with you. Zappy, we're ending it with you. A brief closeout, and then I have got some things to say, too. And, and we could go on for hours about this. Who knows? We may well one day. Zappy, the last <laughs> word today is on you. The last word for me is that if you find yourself in a psychedelic neutral place, I urge you to take that opportunity to go inside yourself, try to get some answers and some healing. Hopefully you do it in the best set and setting possible so you get as much benefit as possible. But to wait around for the medical establishment, doctors who don't even know about nutrition to tell you how a good MDMA trip should go, I think that's a mistake. We have to leave it to the people that have the understanding. And you know these organizations like MAPS and things, they come out of people being breaking the law to do what they were doing. And then here it comes. If they'd waited for the law, you know, we'd probably have a million people committing suicide a year and a million people overdosing. So take this opportunity, trust nature, go inside. And if, and the last thing I'll say is don't take it seriously. It's nothing, life, this whole thing, really not meant to be taken so seriously. And these psychedelics give us the opportunity to tap into the bigger picture. So I, inv I urge people listening to take that step trust it you've seen it on netflix on michael pollan you've seen aaron Rodgers. of course we need these things to be done properly but we have to access this now because we're in an absolute crisis so i'm gonna close out with some takeaways on my own first of all when people talk about de uh, decriminalization or legalization to more of a neophyte like me it has seemed a lot more um, simple than it actually is. The considerations out there, as well as the factors to be weighed, are all significant. They're heavy, and they require thought. After everything we've already heard on this podcast, bringing that into this sort of policy and forward-thinking direction will really inform those of us who continue to listen to or watch this podcast as we talk in more depth in the next series of episodes about some of these political, cultural, and social implications and what a world with psychedelics legalized, whether it's under your vision, Jonathan, or Zappy under yours, or something else altogether, what that may be like. All I can say is my mind has been blown. You've given me a lot, a lot to think about. And thank you both for bringing all of that intellectual capital into the room, as well as being so passionate about your points. It has been incredible having you on the show. Jonathan and Zabby, quickly, where can we find out more about each of you? Uh, Jonathan, you can I'll reach start out with to you. me on Twitter at, at John Lubecki. Uh, I'm on Facebook, Instagram. Just search my name, you'll find me. Thank you, Zappy. Uh, check out uh, Zappy Zappelin, Z A P P Y, Zappelin, Z A P O L I N, on social media. And you can check out the Mind Army at mindarmy.org and join us. We're going to get this legalized sooner than it otherwise would be. And, audience, if you enjoyed today's episode and want to learn more, be sure to subscribe, leave a review or comment and tell the folks that you care about what we're doing as well as what these two incredible minds are doing. If you are so inclined, we strongly urge you to follow Webdelics on Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube as well. And be sure to check out our web site, webdelics.com. That's W-E-B-D-E-L-I-C-S.com.
for trusted information about plant medicine and psychedelics. Then join us next time for another episode of the Web Delics Podcast. Peace.